anti-aircraft defense systems bogged down in the mud, soldiers fed with expired food, abandoned armored vehicles and tanks destroyed everywhere, or even captured by Ukrainian civilians. These are some of the images that have gone viral on social networks, which show the real state of Russian offensive forces in Ukraine. Russian weaponry is far behind the expectations that had been created, and it has proven in Ukraine to be a real disaster. But why? For years, Russia made the whole world believe that it had an enviable military industry. While we all know that the Russian economy is not the most advanced in the world, the military industry seemed to be the exception to the rule. It was the crown jewel of Russian industry, employing some 3 million people or 20% of the industrial workforce. This is shown by Vladimir Putin every May 9th at the military parade celebrating the victory in World War II. Moscow's Red Square fills with people to see the new weaponry of his army. Sukhoi Su-34 fighter jets perform aerobatics. Invincible Armada T-14 tanks roll through the streets. And everyone shudders when Putin shows off his nuclear missiles in front of the Kremlin. Moreover, since 2008, Putin's top priority has been the modernization of his military. He has invested in recent years more than 5% of GDP in defense, putting all available resources into upgrading his weaponry. So, when Russia decided to invade Ukraine, everyone thought that in a few days it could take Ukraine without any problems. But this was not the case. Today's Russian military industry is the heir of the Soviet one, which was full of loss-making state enterprises, obsolete factories and lots of corruption. None of that has changed today. There is still a very centralized system based on state monopolies that favor corruption. The state still maintains a central role in all industries. And that includes weaponry. The companies are run by technocrats closely linked to Vladimir Putin, rather than by members of the Communist Party as in Soviet times. Many of them trade in the KGB just like Putin. But it is a system that breeds very bad incentives to be efficient and innovative, and it causes a lot of failures and corruption. The Russian economy is designed so that no major enterprises can get out of the control of Putin and his technocrats. But when it comes to management and innovation, these technocrats are incapable of achieving good results. Fighter planes that in theory are a technological prodigy but do not have adequate ammunition. State-of-the-art tanks cannot be mass-produced because funding is not available. Precision missiles that are not accurate at all. And this is only part of the problem. Add to this inefficient weapons maintenance system leading to all kinds of failures in tanks, aircraft, armored vehicles, missiles and more. For years, Putin's inner circle has been hiding these shortcomings. But now, they are impossible to hide. The reality of the Russian air offensive is a very good example. The question that all military analysts have been asking since the beginning of the war is why Russia was not able to achieve air supremacy. Why wasn't Russia able to destroy Ukraine's anti-craft defenses so that Russian planes could fly over the entire Ukrainian territory without any problems? This is the first thing Russia should have done to finish off its enemy as soon as possible, especially considering the gigantic differences between them. At the beginning of the conflict, Ukraine had only 134 combat fighters, and all of them were old relics of the Soviet era. Russia, on the other hand, had almost 1,200 planes. Many of them are modern fighters, such as the Sukhoi Su-34, which are as good as the American F-15. The problem is that these fighters have no precision ammunition to fire, because Russian factories centralized in state-owned enterprises have a lot of problems to mass-produce. So the Sukhoi Su-34's state-of-the-art technological prodigy has been firing conventional ammunition, so-called dumb bombs. These are bombs that cannot be guided and therefore are not accurate at all, and they end up sometimes hitting anywhere. Like, for example, in maternity hospitals, as happened in Mariupol on March 9, where three people died, including one child, 
and 17 others were wounded. Also, with few precision missiles, these planes are forced to fly low. By flying low, they become easy targets for Ukrainian anti-aircraft defenses. Thus, the best and most advanced Russian aircraft are being easily destroyed in Ukraine because they do not have adequate ammunition. And something similar has happened with tanks. Russia lost, between destroyed and abandoned equipment, about 1,500 tanks in the first three months of this war, according to estimates of the Ukrainian army. This is equal to about 50% of the total number of tanks that it has in a position to send to war. This is insane. And raises a question, how much longer will Russia be able to keep sending its tanks to be destroyed in Ukraine? As we told in a previous video, Russia has supposedly developed the most modern and fearsome main battle tank, the Armata T-14. But like the modern guided missiles of the Sukhoi Su-34, it has not been able to mass-produce this tank either. So, it has sent to Ukraine mainly its T-72s, T-80, and to a lesser extent, modern T-90 tanks. And while many of these tanks have been upgraded with defense systems such as reactive explosive armors, they have not been effective in countering attacks by man-portable anti-tank missiles such as the American Javelin or the British Enlaw. NATO forces have sent thousands of these anti-tank systems to Ukraine, and they have been able to slow the advance of Russian tanks. Moreover, there is another problem. Russian tanks have always favored a compact form. They are lighter and smaller than their Western counterparts, and they are more agile during battle. Precisely because of their compact size, these tanks can only carry three crew members, compared to four for Western tanks. To replace the crew member who inserts the shells, Russian tanks are equipped with an automatic turret. The ammunition must be placed directly under the turret and also under the soldier's feet. In American and European models, shells are stored in the rear of the tank, outside the turret, separated from the operators by an armored wall. Thus, Russian tanks are particularly vulnerable to javelin and enlaws that can attack them from above, where the armor is thinner. As soon as there is heat or overpressure in the cockpit of a T-72 or a T-80 from the impact of an enemy missile, there is a risk of explosion of the reserve ammunition. The design flaw, called Jack in the Box, explains the video seen from Ukraine, where Russian tank turrets are seen propelled several meters into the air after an internal explosion. And there is an additional reason that helps to explain the failure of Russian weaponry in Ukraine – poor maintenance practices in lousy storage conditions. Keeping weaponry in good working order is not an easy task. It involves a lot of work and a lot of money. And it is the difference between a real military force and a total failure. Military weaponry receives unusual wear and tear when in storage, much greater than that received by civilian vehicles and machines. Maintenance processes must be strict and precise, and a constant flow of new spare parts is also necessary. Russia, like all the world's armies, has detailed manuals for vehicle maintenance. But it is a safe bet that good maintenance practices have been neglected, as evidenced by some of the images that have surfaced recently. Tires have been seen bleeding oil due to poor maintenance, which resulted in many Russian vehicles being abandoned in the field and captured by the Ukrainians. Even some of those vehicles, like this Grand Launcher, had tires made in the USSR. That is, someone searched in the deepest recesses of the tire depots until they found a really old one to put on one of the vehicles and sent them to Ukraine. It is really amazing. And this has a very big implication. If the tires are not in condition, they cannot risk sending them through the muddy fields of Ukraine. That is why we have seen that Russian tanks and mainly armored vehicles move only on roads in Ukraine which makes them specially easy targets for Ukrainian defense systems like Javelin and Enla. Another video shows a Russian BMP fighting vehicle desperately trying to fire its main gun, stuck in the middle of a Ukrainian attack that already destroyed another Russian BMP. All these failures in Russian weaponry are not only due to poor maintenance, typical of a system that bolsters inefficiency, theft and corruption. 
we must add to the mix of problems the flawed storage system of Russian weapons. Let's take tanks as an example. Russia keeps its unused tanks at bases for storage and repair, where most of these tanks are stored outdoors. But the Russian climate is especially damaging to mechanical equipment of all kinds. Recorded temperatures range from 45 degrees Celsius or 113 degrees Fahrenheit and somewhere to minus 71 degrees Celsius or minus 96 degrees Fahrenheit in winter. And most regions of Russia have significant amounts of rainfall throughout the year. Let us compare this briefly with how the US does. The largest tank storage depot in the US is Sierra Army Depot in Northern California. It stores about 29,000 pieces of equipment, including about 2,000 Abrams tanks. Located in the desert at 1,200 meters above sea level, its arid climate makes it ideal for the long-term storage of military equipment. Quite the opposite is true for Russian weaponry. Moreover, as Russian storage bases are generally located in poor, isolated, and poorly protected regions, theft of parts and gutting of all types of weaponry is a constant occurrence. Then, when these tanks are needed, they're not in a usable condition. In March 2022, for example, Ukraine reported that stored tanks transported to a Russian maintenance base near the Ukrainian border arrived in unusable conditions, stripped of valuable optical and electronic elements which contained high-value metals. Some were even missing their engines and only one out of ten tanks were serviceable. Finally, we should not forget the lack of training of the army sent to Ukraine. It is no secret that at least two-thirds of the Russian forces are recruits without experience, training, or discipline. The absence of professionalism is quite noticeable on the battlefield. It is very common for Russian troops to abandon weapons simply because they do not know how to make simple repairs. All this is a deadly cocktail for the Russian army. Although it is facing a theoretically inferior force, the latter, supported with all kinds of modern weaponry and training by the West, is putting up a tough fight that few could have predicted. Now, there is only one question left to answer. Russia has the largest nuclear arsenal in the world, and Putin has even threatened to use it. But does it work? What if a good part of those nuclear warheads were expired? What if the intercontinental ballistic missiles were not as effective as the Kremlin claims? No one wants to answer this in practice. But I would like you to leave your opinion in the comment box. And if you like this video, be sure to watch the next one.